Welcome to our Wednesday worship on this Remembrance Day 2020. Even though we cannot be together in person, we still gather virtually and spiritually together in the presence of Almighty God. So let us commit ourselves to work in penitence and faith for reconciliation between the nations that all people may together live in freedom, justice and peace. We pray for all who in bereavement, disability and pain continue to suffer the consequences of fighting and terror. We remember with thanksgiving and sorrow those whose lives in world wars and conflicts past and present have been given and taken away. Our Gospel reading is from John chapter 15 verses 13 to 17, the famous words of Jesus. Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants, but because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything that I learned from my father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you, so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. And so that... Whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. This is my command. Love each other. On this day of remembrance, let us commit ourselves again to responsible living and faithful service. Let us strive for all that makes for peace. Seek to heal the wounds of war and work for a just future for all humanity. Let us pray. Merciful God, we offer to you the fears in us that have not been cast out by love. May we accept the hope you have placed in the hearts of all people and live lives of justice, courage and mercy. Through Jesus Christ, our risen Redeemer. Amen.
Well, later in our service, we'll remember all those who have died in the violence of war and all those in the armed forces today who are still in danger. We remember their sacrifice and the sacrifice of their family. We remember all those whose lives are disfigured by war or terror. As we hold at 11 o'clock a two-minute silence. But first, we will return to our sermon series on the book of Ruth and ask what this story of Naomi and Ruth can teach us in these days that we are living in now. Today's passage is from Ruth chapter 3, verses 1 to 18. One day Naomi, her mother-in-law, said to her, My daughter, should I not try to find a home for you, where you'll be provided for? Is not Boaz, with whose serving girls you have been, a kinsman of ours? Tonight he will be winnowing barley on the threshing floor. Wash and perfume yourself and put on your best clothes. Then go down to the threshing floor. But don't let him know you are there until he has finished eating and drinking. When he lies down, note the place where he is lying. Then go and uncover his feet and lie down. He will tell you what to do. I'll do whatever you say, Ruth answered. So she went down to the threshing floor and did everything her mother-in-law had told her to do. When Boaz had finished eating and drinking and was in good spirits, he went over to lie down at the far end of the grain pile. Ruth approached quietly, uncovered his feet and lay down. In the middle of the night, something startled the man and he turned and discovered a woman lying at his feet. Who are you? He asked. I am your servant, Ruth, she said. Spread the corner of your garment over me, since you are kinsman redeemer. The Lord bless you, my daughter, he replied. This kindness is greater than that which you showed earlier. You have not run after the younger men, whether rich or poor. And now, my daughter, don't be afraid. I'll do for you all you ask. All my fellow townsmen know that you are a woman, a woman of noble character. Although it is true that I am a near, near of kin, there is a kinsman redeemer nearer than I. Stay here for the night, and in the morning, if he wants to redeem, good, let him redeem. But if he is not willing, as surely as the Lord lives, I will do it. Lie here until morning. So she lay at his feet until morning, but got up before anyone could be recognised. And he said, don't let it be known that a woman came to the threshing floor. He also said, bring me the shawl you are wearing and hold it out. When she did so, he poured into it six measures of barley and put it on her. Then he went back to town. When Ruth came to her mother-in-law, Naomi asked, how did it go, my daughter? Then she told her everything Boaz had done for her and added, he gave me these six measures of barley, saying, don't go back to your mother-in-law empty-handed. Then Naomi said, Wait, my daughter, until you find out what happens, for the man will not rest until the matter is settled today. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Paul will now speak to us on this passage, and then we will have a song to have a time of reflection together, followed by Liz, who will lead us in a time of prayer. Uh, good morning. In the past few weeks, we've been uh, looking at the book of Ruth and the story of Naomi and her daughter-in-law, Ruth, going on a hazardous journey from Moab to Judah in the hope that Naomi's family would take them in and provide them some of the basic necessities of life, you know, food and shelter and so on. But when they get back uh, to Judah, and instead of sitting around and waiting for the men to take over and do the planning, Naomi and Ruth get their heads together and take some initiative in looking ahead, planning for their future. The first positive thing that happens is Ruth gets a bit of work on behalf of both of them in a field, picking up grain that the reapers had not taken. It was it called uh, gleaning. And it turns out that the field that Ruth gleaned in was owned by Naomi's kinsman, a man called Boaz. And Ruth returns to Naomi to tell her she's been gleaning in Boaz's field. And Naomi says, that man is a close relative, is one of our kinsmen redeemers. 
In fact, the whole story of Ruth and Naomi is dependent on the concept of kinsmen redeemers. And what that means is that ne the nearest male relative in Judah of Naomi's deceased husband has responsibility to look after Naomi and her daughter-in-law since she's also married into the family. And so Naomi develops her plan to bring Boaz and Ruth closer together. And all this is in spite of the fact that they lived in a very patriarchal society and usually men made all the decisions about everything. I was listening to a video conversation recently about some events that took place in Northern Ireland during the Troubles. A lady called Kathleen tells how her husband, a civil servant, not involved in any way in the Troubles, uh, one night the family were at home and the IRA burst in and took her husband away and left a gunman with them to see that they didn't go out and raise the alarm. They took her husband, chained him into the driving seat of a vehicle loaded with explosives and forced him, with, probably with threats to kill the family if he didn't, to drive the vehicle to an army checkpoint and then they triggered the explosive with remote control device. Kathleen's husband and five British soldiers were killed. And of course, when Kathleen heard what had happened, she was absolutely devastated. But life had to go on and she thought to herself, what am I going to do now after this has happened? Am I going to spend the rest of my life enraged and bitter and twisted because of this thing that's happened? So what she decided to do was to work for peace in Northern Ireland. For example, to, to, to stop the IRA or the Protestant paramilitaries doing revenge killings for her husband and the five British soldiers. So instead of taking the initiative for revenge, she takes the initiative for peace. The other participant in this conversation was a woman called Anne. As she grew up in her teenage years, she went to loads of IRA funerals, people who'd been killed in the Troubles, and she was brainwashed into hating the British and the Protestants. And all her family and neighbours hated the British and the Protestants. At 18, Anne joined the IRA and became a terrorist operative and was involved in all sorts of horrible and violent events, which she now bitterly regrets. Kathleen and Anne are now close friends. Over the last 20 years or more, they've talked together with groups and individuals about the futility of war, of the need to do everything possible to prevent violence turn into war and try to res resolve the issues in other ways. Now today being Armistice Day, our thoughts turn to wars in the relatively recent past, in particular f the First and Second World Wars. And we remember the many men and women who fought in these wars and died. In the First World War, Britain and their allies lost over a million dead. I mean, it's an incredible number, really. A million people killed. Then came the Second World War, the fight to prevent uh, uh, Hitler and fascism taking over. There's probably never been a time in human history where there has not been a war going on somewhere. If you look at the Bible, the killing starts with one of the sons of Adam and Eve. Cain slew his brother Abel, and it's been going on ever since. What war is about in most cases is power. Taking over somebody else's land and subjecting the inhabitants to their philosophy, religion, culture, way of life. 
and it may be that the hairy-chested male machismo has been the tr trigger that has, in human history, has created a lot of conflict and wars that could have been avoided by the intervention of thoughtful and peace-loving women. Women like Naomi, who took the initiative when she was the lowest of the low in social status and in a patriarchal society, in theory she was bereft of influence and power, but she decided not to leave her fate to the men, but take the initiative for herself and her daughter-in-law. Now, I'm not under any illusions about the ability of some women to be as bloody-minded and violent as men. I've witnessed outbreaks of violence in women's prison that almost made my hair stand on end. When I went there, I used to always sit with my back to the wall near the door, uh, ready for a rapid exit should this uh, be necessary. But these women, I think, were exceptional because of all sorts of factors, the main one being the violence and abuse they had suffered from men. There are other women in the Bible, notably one called Esther, who was a thoughtful and prayerful person and diverted a holocaust from the Jewish people. Esther was the wife of one of the Persian kings during the 5th century BC and she took her life in her hands when she went and appealed to the king to stop a plot which threatened to wipe out her people. And ever since the 5th century Jewish 5th century BC, Jewish people have celebrated the festival of Purim to remember how their ancestors narrowly escaped an annihilation because of the bravery of Esther. There are a number of other prominent women in the Old Testament who were leaders and take the initiative in spite of the fact that they lived in societies which were primarily patriarchal. For example, in the book of Judges, we read about Deborah. Deborah was, is the fourth, and as far as anybody seems to know, the only female judge. So in chapter four of the book of Judges, Deborah was said, was leading Israel. She held courts in the country of Ephraim, and the Israelites came to her to have their disputes decided. It could well be that the world would be a better place if more women like Naomi, Esther, Anne, Kathleen and others decided to try and take the initiative away from men in times of conflict. Today being Armistice Day, we remember the appalling destruction and loss of life that took place in the First and Second World Wars and many other wars as well. And it may be that in general terms at least some women like Naomi and Kathleen, Anne, Esther and Deborah could and would bring a different perspective to conflict with a potential for war and be more likely to seek a thoughtful and peaceful solution to whatever the problems may be. Amen.
let us pray. As we enter prayer now, let's pause to be still, to breathe deeply, and to recenter our scattered senses upon the presence of God. Lord, as we remember with sadness today the horror of war, help us to work for a better understanding between races and nations. Open our eyes to see our own part in discord and aggression between people. Forgive us our pride and divisions and renew in us a search for peace so that trust may replace suspicion, friendship replace fear, and your spirit of reconciliation be known among us. We remember with gratitude those who have fought for the freedom of our country. We give thanks for those who died during two world wars and in all other conflicts since then. We lift to you, Lord, those who have suffered life-changing injuries as a result of war, and who live still with those consequences. Bless those who care for them, we pray. We ask for your love and compassion for all those who have lost loved ones. Continue to bring them comfort and hope. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. In these strange and difficult times in which we are living, many church communities have lost their rhythms of meeting and worshipping together face to face. How shall we sing the Lord's song? in a strange land. Lord, in these dark and difficult times, grant us grace to seek your face with undiminished love. Replenish our reserves, for the road is long. Surprise us in the coming day with glimpses of your goodness, hints of your holiness, and a song of hope in this very strange land. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for the United States of America as they prepare for a new president. We pray for President-elect Joe Biden and his Vice President-elect Kamala Harris. May they look to you for guidance, Lord, and act with honesty and integrity for the good of all. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for our own government and our local leaders. In these challenging times, we ask for godly wisdom and guidance for the way ahead. We pray for those whose businesses and jobs have been adversely affected by COVID-19, and for those whose health, mental, physical and spiritual, has been damaged. Lord, bring hope to your people, both in this country and throughout the world. We pray that in your great mercy, you would reach down and bring healing and blessing. We ask you, Father God, to draw close to all those who have been overwhelmed with sorrow, those who have felt paralysed by the deep, dark ache of loss and isolation. Comfort them and care for them, we pray. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayer. Fill us afresh today with your enabling Holy Spirit, that we may shine your light in the world and bring your love 
to those with whom we have contact. May those who meet us see Christ in us and be led to a deeper and greater knowledge of your grace and blessing in their lives. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you, Paul and Liz. We've now come to that time in our service and we'll remember with gratitude those who in the cause of peace and the service of their fellow men died for their country in a time of war. Please stand if you're able. shall grow not old, as we that are left grow old. Age shall not weary them, nor the years condemn. At the going down of the sun, and in the morning, we will remember them. We will remember them.
When you go home, tell them of us and say, for your tomorrow, we gave our today. Thank you for joining us today for our special service on this Remembrance Day. May God grant to the living grace, to the departed rest, to the Church, the Queen, the Commonwealth and all people, unity, peace and concord, and to us and all God's servants, life everlasting. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be with you all and remain with you always. Amen. your eyes on me hold on my child hold on my child